Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. Welcome to Murder and Mimosas, a true crime podcast brought to you by a mother and daughter duo, bringing you murder stories with the mimosas in hand. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started. Our show is Murder and Mimosa, a true crime podcast. This means that we do discuss crimes, including but not limited to disappearances, murder, and sexual assault. All our episodes are told with the respect of the victims and the victims' families in mind. We strive to ensure that we provide factual information, but some information is more verifiable than others. With that, grab your mimosas and let's dive in. Welcome back. I'm Shannon. And I'm Danica. Today we're going to tell you the story of the Goldmark murders. So grab your mimosas, you sip while we share. It's Christmas Eve in 1985 and the Goldmark family are expecting guests to arrive for a holiday dinner. The ham is in the oven, other pots are simmering on the stove, and 43-year-old Annie is upstairs taking a shower. Annie has her Swedish gown laid out that she wears every Christmas Eve. For the past several years, and 41-year-old Charles is eagerly awaiting their guest. The table is set, appetizers are on the counter, and the stockings are hanging from the fireplace. Around 7 o'clock, they hear someone at the door. 10-year-old Colin answers the door to find a man standing there with a white box. He asks Colin for his father, and Colin calls for him to come to the door. Once he's at the door, the intruder pulls a gun which we will later find out it was just a toy gun, and he pushes his way into the house. He asks who else is in the house, and he says his other son, 12-year-old Derek, and his wife is in the shower upstairs. The intruder has them all head upstairs to the master bedroom to get Annie out of the shower. She dresses in her robe, and the intruder has them all lie down on the floor, facing away from him so they won't notice his toy gun. Charles asks if he wants money, and he says, well, I mean, it wouldn't hurt. Charles gives him the $14 out of his wallet. He then handcuffs both Annie and Charles and uses rags covered in chloroform and knocks the family out. Before he knocks them out, though, Charles informs him that they are expecting dinner guests at 730. The intruder had so much planned that since he's not sure if Charles is bluffing or not, he has to make this quick. He grabs an iron and bludgeons all four of the gold marks in the head. He feels for a pulse when he's done, and they aren't dead yet. He heads to the kitchen to get a knife, and he notices the gash in Charles' head when he returns. He takes the knife, and he stabs him in the open wound in his head. And while he has the knife there, we'll later learn that he says he swished it around. Although Annie, too, had been beaten in the head, she didn't have a gaping wound like her husband, and the intruder strapped stabbed her in the ear and in the chest, which killed her immediately. He did find head wounds on both of the boys and did the same thing to them as he did to Charles. Knowing time was running out, he grabbed the debit card, took the phone off the hook, and shut off all the lights and left out the basement door. Okay, this sounds like a robbery gone bad, but you said he had a lot planned. Does this mean this family was a target or like a lot of murders he wanted to get his jollies off on the torture? I mean, what did he have planned exactly? There is actually a lot to unpack in that question. So let me start with the intruder. He happens to be 27-year-old David Lewis Ross. David had grown up mostly in Colorado, but his dad was a construction worker and they did move around a lot. His brothers described him as very quiet, a loner, and he never really had any friends. When he was four years old, he fell through a sliding glass door and sustained a head injury. Not only that, but his right eye was cut and he was legally blind in his right eye due to this fall. I mean, I would think that that would kind of make most of us insecure and honestly could explain maybe the lack of friends for him growing up. It could have. Um, His brothers do also say that they picked on him, which of course, I mean, that's what all siblings do. Of course. So when he was around 10 or 11, he got in an argument with one of his brothers, and his brother Randy later found him hanging from a noose in the bedroom. 
it already turned blue and they did get him down and revived him. That seems really extreme for just an argument, but we also don't know what else was going on and what, you know, demons he may have been fighting internally. I realize this was the 80s. Mental health wasn't like a thing, really, um, especially compared to now. But, I mean, did they get him any type of help? They actually did get him a therapist that he went to just a few times. But not long after beginning his treatments there, the doctor got busted for molestation of his clients. That's the lowest of low, Scott. They're coming to you for help. They're already in a bad mental state. And you just take advantage of him? I hope that you got justice for that. Was David one of his victims? He never said, and his brothers later said that they don't think he would have ever admitted it if it had happened to him. So he ends up dropping out of school at 15, and at some point he enlists in the Navy, but he gets discharged during basic training. And I wish I could find out why he was discharged, but I never could find anything out about that. He gets married at 21. He has a son. Also, I couldn't really find any information on his wife and son, which I can't blame them. And I don't think he stayed in their lives from what I could tell. His wife ended up divorcing him, though, because he was charged with indecent exposure. So he ends up having all these odd random jobs. He doesn't keep them long. And then in 1982, both of his brothers encourage him to move to Seattle, where they are, so maybe they can help him. He has more jobs that don't pan out. He's couch surfing at times, living in his car, and then he decides he's going to go to school to be a welder. Finally, things are looking up for him until he's laid off. Not to mention that he also burned his left eye while welding. And of course, when people describe him, they talk about he's these really creepy eyes he has because now both of them are messed up. I don't know about the 80s in Seattle, but here, at least in Arkansas, welding jobs are in pretty high demand. Was he able to find a job pretty quickly so that he's not homeless and living in his car again? No, and he is not happy about it either. His unemployment compensation ends up running out before he finds another job, and sometimes people just need someone or something to blame for things going on in their life, and he blamed the community the communist taking over America and Jews. Okay, Hitler. <laughs> So, in 1982, David met 40-year-old Ann Davis, a naturopath doctor that invited him to come live with her in her apartment, among, well, other things. So, he got himself a sugar mama, is what you're saying. Or she could have got herself a boy toy. Either way, um, that's pretty much what I'm saying. So, Ann also introduced him to a club she was a member of, the Duck Club. And no, it's not for duck hunting. This was a club founded in 1980 by Robert Watt, and this was an extremist, anti-communist, anti-Jewish group that had a chapter in Seattle. He is all in on this because, like I said, he's looking for someone to blame. While at the meetings, he hears the mention of gold marks being communist and Jews. Okay, starting to get the connection now. It sounds like it, but also not really. I have to tell you about Charles's parents for you to fully get the whole picture. His mother, Sally, joined a communist party in 1935, thinking she agreed with them and that this could really help boost the economic crisis. And then she meets her soon-to-be husband, John, in 1942, and the two begin their love affair. John was not fond of the Communist Party, and Sally mentioned to him that she had joined a Communist Party. He told her even though he didn't like her views on politics, he loved her, and he just didn't care. Wow, if only we could all be this understanding of other people's views. Right, imagine how much better things would be. So Sally ended up dropping out of the Communist Party in 1943, which is when the two of them got married. Life happened, and then in 1956, John ran for the House of Representatives and won. And he held this for two terms, but was running for his third term when word got out to the press that Sally had been a member of the Communist Party. 
It was definitely a smear campaign. John lost the election, but he didn't take it lying down. He filed a lawsuit for $225,000 for defamation of their names. They were awarded $40,000, but after they won, of course, it was appealed. The Supreme Court ended up ruling public officials could not collect damages for criticism of their official actions in absence of proof of actual malice. So, all right, back to David. This lawsuit was talked about in the Duck Club, and David looks up the gold marks, and he finds an article about the gold marks moving to an affluent neighborhood, and they even give the address in the paper. This must have been a slow news day if this was newsworthy. Maybe this stuff is still the papers. I don't know. I obviously don't read them, but... They were seriously reporting on who moved into the rich neighborhood and was like, here's their address. Yeah, it could have been a slow day. I don't know. But yes, that is what they did. And like you, I don't read the papers, so it may still be a thing. I have no idea. So what David doesn't realize at this, but that is this address is for Charles and Annie, not John and Sally. In fact, John and Sally have both passed away by this time. So this guy... Didn't even do enough research to kill his intended victims. He sure didn't. And to top it all off, none of them were communists or Jews. Not that that even gives him a right to kill them if they were. So back to Christmas Eve, Charles and Annie were expecting dinner guests at 730. Once they arrived, they noticed there were no lights on in the house. They knock on the door and no one answered. For a moment, they thought, Maybe they're playing a prank on us. So they waited on a, on the porch a little bit, playing along. Um, and they knew the Goldbergers hadn't forgot or the gold marks, I'm sorry, hadn't forgotten because, I mean, this had been an annual tradition for years to have dinner with them on Christmas Eve and exchange gifts. So they tried again to at the door. Still no answer. They were worried and they went to the neighbor's house that they knew had a key. So Jeff Haley, Jeff came over and he opened the door. They could hear noises coming from the second floor. Jeff ran upstairs and found a bloodbath in the master bedroom. There was blood splatter all over the place as well as brain matter. The scene was horrible. Oddly enough, Charles wasn't dead. He was covered in blood and moaning, hurt. While lifting up his handcuffs, he was talking about how much they hurt. So while someone called 911, others found something to cut the handcuffs off Charles. Annie, however, was dead when the first responders arrived. But Charles and the boys were still alive somehow, but in very critical condition and not expected to make it. Police began to canvass the neighborhood. And there was a neighbor that tells them that a man had come by with a white box asking for Charles Goldmark. She showed him where he lived and thought nothing of it. But the police assume this has to be their man and they get a sketch. Once David left the Goldmarks, he goes to the bank and tries the ATM card and realizes that they gave him the wrong PIN number. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Kind of funny. It is. Which I wasn't expecting since he actually told them that they had guests coming, but okay. So he throws this card in the bushes and walks the two miles back to Anne's. He'd come there by bus, but he's now covered in blood and knows that he can't get on a bus covered in blood because, of course, that would raise suspicion. Okay, obviously, I don't know how much blood was on him, but just from the sounds of the crime scene... And the way he killed them, he's got to look suspicious regardless walking around because he's got to be covered in blood too. At least it's the only way I can imagine. Yeah, and I would be so wor- nervous walking around anywhere. I mean, you <laughs> just look like a nutcase. But by whatever means, he still gets there um, without being caught or anything. And he gets to Anne's. He hides his bloody clothes after he cleans up and changes. On the way to Anne's, he realizes that he left the handcuffs and they actually have his fingerprints on them. 
So he decides he's just going to change and he's going to head back over there before anybody notices and grab those handcuffs. Okay. Is Anne home? I mean, what does she say or have to think about this when he just walks in covered in blood? Anne was actually gone for the holidays and she had told him um, that she left some money for food, but told him by the time she got back on the 28th, he needed to be gone. She had said that he had been acting really strange. He was talking about voices from outer space. These voices weren't audible. He was just getting these messages telepathically, which, okay. Either way, (laughs) it's crazy. They were warning him about Jews and communists. And they also told him he was a soldier. Yeah, and if your boy toy is talking like that, it's time for a new one. It's close to Christmas, just... Write a letter to Santa because that one's got to (laughs) go. So he heads back to the house. He sees the police surrounding the house and he assumes he's going to be busted once the fingerprint analysis come back on the handcuffs. He spends the night roaming the streets and riding the bus since he's now officially homeless again. The The next day he heads to Homer Brand's house. This was the president of the Duck Club. It's now Christmas Day and Homer and his family were actually heading out. David tells him how the police are after him because he had just, and I quote, I just stumped the top communists. There were four of them, end quote. Homer ignored David since he was used to him rambling, and he didn't really take anything he said serious. He excused himself and said he had to go for a family event. He then goes to the house of Robert Brown. This is another member of the Duck Club. He tells Robert he needs a place to crash, and only God knows why he let this man crash on his couch when he barely knows him. Maybe he was overtaken by the Christmas spirit. Sometimes people are a little more generous during that time of the year. I don't know that I would be that generous any time of the year, but some people are. Well, the next morning, Robert notices a tablet on the coffee table, and he reads it while David's still asleep, and it reads... To whom it may concern, I am the person you're looking for in the gold mark case. I know that what I did was a very terrible thing. This is why I am as you see me now. I want it perfectly understood that no one else had anything whatsoever to do with what I did. I went to great lengths to make sure of that. The person I live with doesn't even know that I'm wanted on a different charge. She received a couple of messages on her machine, but I erased them before she got to them. Did not use that rifle that I purchased a few weeks ago. Instead, I fooled them with a toy pistol, which you will find in the storage locker. I threw the rifle away a couple weeks ago. Again, I want it understood that no one knew anything about this. So please do not cause any unnecessary suffering to innocent people. I think that I've already done enough. I guess I should tell you why I did what I did. That way, you won't have to ask other people about it. My life is a mess. It has been ever since my wife left me. Anne was trying to help me straighten out, but I'm afraid. Robert isn't sure if this is a story he's just concocted in his head, or is this actually a confession? He hasn't read the papers in a few days, or even watched the news for that matter. He's trying to decide what to do, if anything, and then David wakes up. He tells David he's going to go get a pack of cigarettes. And while heading to a club he belonged to, he did ask a few people along the way had they heard of the Goldmark murders, which most people had. One even held up a newspaper that had the gold marks on the front page. Talk about unwanted house guests. At this point, this dude's like mind has to be racing. Like, why did I let this stranger in? If I go back to my own place, like, am I going to be the next to die? Would not want to be in his shoes. He definitely does not want to go back, so he calls the police from a payphone. The police arrive, and they're speaking to Robert across the street when they see David leaving the building. The police take off for him on foot. Eventually, he stops running, and and he pulls a vial from his pocket and drinks it down and tosses the vial. Okay, I know you're, like, deep in this story, uh, but what's in the vial, and why and who just walks around carrying one in their pocket? So they do analyze the bottle, and it was liquid nicotine. Okay, liquid nicotine. 
so I don't really get that. Is this like a lethal dose or is that a thing? From what I can gather, I think it was a suicide attempt. So I did look this up. So 60 milligrams is enough to kill you. And I don't know how much was in the vial, but I think that that was his plan was try to kill himself with this vial of liquid nicotine, which I'd never heard of till this case. So he's taken to the station. They find the key for the handcuffs in his pocket, and they ask if he wants to finish the letter he started at Robbers, and he agrees to do that. Okay, I mean, his letter did kind of end abruptly. Clearly wasn't finished, but you never know. I'm afraid that she isn't able to do much for me. I'm too far gone. When I left high school, I could go out and get a job in any town at any time I needed. When I got married, jobs were starting to get scarce. I had to do more walking and searching to find work. I found myself more and more on the unemployment line, which was getting long. This is where the letter stops, and he tells them that he'd rather just tell them what happened. But after he speaks to an attorney, even after speaking to his attorney, he tells them everything. He said he had been staking them out for about six months, although he had yet to see them at all. So I can't say how good he really is at staking someone out. I was about to say, did he show up at the wrong house? <laughs> yes. Was he even staking out the right people? He says he bought the chloroform and had tried it out on himself. Uh, bought it where? Apparently a drugstore. I did also look that up because that kind of threw me for a loop. And apparently you could buy it in a drugstore until around 1979 which I was thinking this was past 1979. So maybe he was trying it on himself just to see if it was still good out Did of date. Buy it with his liquid nicotine? <laughs> this is just a store of random things. I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I don't know what was happening with that. So he also tells police he had planned on getting information out of Charles about other communist members, but he didn't have time since guests may have been coming. He also tells them that he didn't plan on kids being there because of course he thought this was a really old couple. Maybe if he had done his research. (laughs) Yeah. He says he didn't want to have to kill kids, but that's just what a soldier does. A soldier. He isn't a soldier on a mission. In his mind, though, he is. So let's listen to this clip that he's talking to a a reporter about all this for a minute. Hey, look. I guess that you can just look around. Um, The thing that really got to me and brought me into this was the fact that I had trained for a welding job. And I trained uh, very hard for about a year. And uh, I got one job out of that. And I was doing okay until the, until the uh, shop shut down. And I went on for uh, just over a year before I finally came to the conclusion that something is definitely wrong. You know, something is wrong. This country does not get in this kind of shape without somebody actually putting it in that shape. And uh, if you look around, all you have to do is open your eyes and see that, yeah, it's being done purposefully. And uh, I believe it was in uh, 60, I think it was 67, that Khrushchev said uh, that they would destroy our country and they wouldn't fire a shot doing it. In order to do that, they'll take the United States and they'll cause a civil war to do it. Looney Tunes. <laughs> now this guy blows my mind. I will say he said one thing that I believe and it said that if you look around this country can't get in the shape this in without someone putting it there. That was it. That was the only thing. Like, I do agree with that. Someone did it. Um, but I don't know that I, well, I know for a fact I don't believe it was communist and Jews, but that's where our, our thinking no longer is. 
Well, he is a real piece of work. He was originally charged with one murder and three attempted murders. But unfortunately, the rest of the Goldmark family passed at various times, with Derek being the last to pass on January 30th of 1986. Okay, with all this that he gave police, I am assuming, like, he pled guilty. Well, hang on. I say that. And then I remember (laughs) who I'm talking about. Was there a trial? Well, his attorney uses the good old insanity defense. To be fair, if I was his attorney, I also (laughs) would use that defense. Okay, but we talked before about the fact that you may have a mental illness, but that does not negate you from being competent to stand trial. And how a mental illness doesn't necessarily mean that the de- insanity defense gets you out of a murder charge. So we won't go into that now. We've talked about that before. But for this case, what happened to him? So the jury finds him guilty of all four counts of murder, and he is given the death pencil penalty. Okay. During this phase, did they evaluate him to see if he's competent to stand trial? Is he diagnosed with a mental order? Because I'm not a doctor, but in my uh, humble opinion, (laughs) he seems to have one. So they do diagnose him with paranoid delusion disorder. He does seem delusional. He does. I agree with him on that. So I wish it had ended there, but 20 minutes before the verdict was read, he drank down more tobacco this liquid tobacco and he's rushed to the hospital to have his stomach pumped how did he get more i I don't know maybe this was just rampant back in the 80s i've never heard of it so this is just blowing my mind so uh, due to another suicide attempt he wasn't present when the jury read the verdict so he appeals on the grounds and of course the ineffective counsel they all use and the decision was affirmed They appeal this to the district court, and Judge Tanner throws out the whole death penalty since David was not in the courtroom when it was imposed. So Assistant Attorney General Jack Jones was appalled at this, and he actually appealed this decision. Eventually, eventually David is granted a whole new trial, But before they go to trial, he decides he will plead guilty if they just take the death penalty off the table, which is what happens. Okay, I am also appalled up there with Jack Jones because that has no bearing on the rest of the case. He wasn't there, but that doesn't change the the decision. That's crazy. But all of these appeals just to take the death penalty off the table when he has tried, as far as we know, to kill himself a few times now. This seems a little odd and like a waste of taxpayers' money, but what else does he have to do in his spare time? He's still in prison to this day and never expected to get out. He not only ruined what could have been a magical Christmas for family, but he took their lives in the process. So, would the Goldmarks have spent the previous Christmas differently had they known it would be their last? We never know when it's going to be our last time together together with loved ones. So, take advantage of every minute that you have with your loved ones this year. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. We always recommend more bubbly and less OJ. Cheers! If you'd like to see pictures from today's episode, you can find us at murder.mimosas on Instagram. You can also find us at murder.mimosas on TikTok, Twitter. And if you have a case you would like us to do, you can send that to murder.mimosas at gmail.com. And lastly, we are on Facebook at Murder and Mimosas Podcast, where you can interact with us there. We love any type of feedback you can give us. So please rate and review us on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.